I'm, I'm Tyler Kirk. I'll, I'll be moderating the panel. This is the panel on just make sure everyone's in the right spot. The secrets of doing a successful ICO. I am an associate in the office here in DC of Wilson, Sensini, Goodrich, and Rosati. I'm in the securities law practice there. Uh, I'm going to give a, just a brief few more words about my background, and I'm going to allow each of our panelists to introduce themselves as well. I started off my career at the Securities and Exchange Commission. I had the good fortune of being there when they first started their internal working group on digital currencies and distributed ledger technology, which was a fascinating time to be at the SEC, being in there at the ground floor when the SEC and the regulators were thinking about this space and how to appropriately regulate it. Uh, after I left the SEC, I jumped to another law firm and then wound up at WSGR because they have a base in Silicon Valley. They have a pipeline of, of tech-interested clients, and it was a really good fit with respect to this emerging new capital formation opportunity that blockchain, initial coin offerings, and the whole crypto asset space presents. So I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have all of our panelists join us and talk about how to do a successful, uh, secrets to doing a successful ICO. And I'm looking forward to hearing what each of you have to say. And I'll start off with Jenna, and I'll allow you to say a few words with yourself, then we'll go to Carol and, and John. Hi everyone, my name is Jenna Binderup, and my background is in writing proposals for a variety of industries, like uh, mostly technical industries, like immigration law, civil engineering and telecom amongst other things so I came into the blockchain and crypto space last year and as soon as I did it was a fire hose of work putting together white papers for ICOs who were hungry for people who had a real background in strategy and putting together documents that were comprehensively uh, marketingly it compelling for investors and also attorneys and regulators so that's that's me and you could write <laughs> that's correct <laughs> yeah I'll tell a story in a bit about that so. um, I'm Carol Van Cleef and uh, you'll have to uh, bear with me for a moment as I try to describe myself um, I have been a lawyer for many many years uh, who has made a bold move to set up a consulting firm called Luminous Group with the idea of providing blockchain technology growth and uh, risk management solutions to uh, the industry. Uh, having observed and been involved in over the last uh, uh, last several years a variety of, a variety of steps in the evolution of blockchain technology and recognizing especially in the last year or so that a lot of companies who raised a lot of money very quickly and a lot of these companies uh, have very little in the way of management structure to start with and certainly very little capability to bring, if any capability to bring a product to market. Um, and uh, as it's clear that there's going to be a growing demand, uh, hopefully a growing demand on the part of investors for greater quality uh, uh, and better understanding through things like the white papers um, of what these transactions are involved in, that's what was behind this. I can't quite move away from the lawyer piece. Um, I, I just, unfortunately, when I open my mouth, I haven't learned not to give legal advice. So I do have, <laughs> I have hung out a bit of a shingle with Claire Ryan, uh, which many of you are uh, Virginia-based, uh, uh, certainly will know well. Um, and uh, I think this is my first initial announcement today that uh, I'm becoming a partner with uh, New Arca which is a name that you're going to hear a lot more about because it's a technology development uh, company that is also uh, involved in venture capital. Uh, it's a very unique business model, first use case uh, that they've been working on, which you're going to hear a lot more about in the coming weeks is po proxy voting services, which goes fully live uh, next month. Hi everybody, I'm John Wise, uh, the CEO of Loki. Um, I think the only one up here that's done a successful ICO personally or, or within our business, but you guys have all consulted on, on many of these. Um, I advise about 27 companies that are either have been through uh, the ICO process or are currently going through it. Um, also an LP and a couple of funds. Um, also the one of the co-founders of the Digital Asset Trade Association Data. 
Um, we're the ones that have been responsible for Wyoming, Colorado, Tennessee, uh, several other states. We've got about 13 other states here that are. Texas is up now, right? Texas, California, New Jersey. I mean, New Jersey tomorrow, speaking with the Senate there. Uh, Virginia, Maryland, Color uh, Colorado's got some other ones that are going through. Um, and uh, Missouri and Mississippi, I believe. I think those will all be by the end of April, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty wild. Like, it's, it's amazing to have to be in all these places. Um, in addition to that, I've, I've been a macroeconomist for, uh, for the World Bank. I've done some consulting for multiple regulators inside the US, um, for the World Economic Forum. I've spoken in, in Davos uh, on the main stage as well as on the crypto side. Um, I've been, a, been around since uh, 2010, although I will say Carol has been in this space for substantially longer uh, than I have. But what was the first year you... I, I've been two feet in the world of digital currency since 2008, so preceding, wow. if you do the math, it's preceding yeah. Bitcoin. I was involved with the gold-backed digital currency system wow. that back in the day, while it was not a decentralized system, many, there were many shared attributes, and uh, including smart contracts existed yeah. then. So I've had a little bit of a jump on the learning curve over a, a lot of other lawyers in particular. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my story, and uh, yeah, if anybody, well, I, I guess most of the questions will come around the legality probably, but the other side is, is, is something I really want to make sure that we get to is what happens after, uh, what happens after an ICO, right? Um, how do you substantiate the valuation for things? How do you really scale a business? Because that's really the, the toughest part. And then um, sort of the third side that I would love to see, I'm kind of a last minute addition here, um, <laughs> Was uh, he didn't and, get the and, email? No. <laughs> um, the, the, the other the other side that I would love to, to get maybe get some sort of uh, perspective from you guys on is is what investors really should look for, right? What is and is not an investment? What really has an opportunity for growth? What doesn't? What is safe, secure? Who's going to get you know sort of these these these. Uh, uh, action letters or, or anything like that, right? Do you do you mind if I ask a level setting question? Absolutely. How many people in the room own cryptos? Ah, oh, this is a great nice. crowd. How many of you own tokens that you've bought through ICOs? How many of you have checked the box that you're not a U.S. resident? <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> and how many of the people that own tokens that bought an ICO are accredited investors? Oh, I assumed in this room everybody two, is. Two of them. The seven that I counted. There Do we go. have anybody in here who is thinking of or is doing an ICO? Oh, wow. okay. Interesting. Nice. Now, wait, is that thinking of doing it or thinking of investing in one? Yeah, that's two so questions. So those who are thinking yeah. of actually doing their be Doing your own ICO. And those who are thinking of investing. Okay. Good. That's, that's good. This is this is a this is this is great. Yeah, I yeah. I did a program with the Angel Capital Group in Boston last week, and uh, of about I don't know seventy five to one hundred people in the audience. I think there were three or four hands that went up and said they even own crypto, uh, much less you know doing anything in the ICO space. So the angel space is you know very much behind uh, in this area. Yeah. Well, I think it's clear we have a awesome panel of uh, diverse talents and, and perspectives. So I think what I want to do is kind of start broadly and we'll drill down to some finer points. I think John, your point about investors and what investors should be looking for, you know, and, and what are the important factors after you do an ICO are really uh, key. Um, and, and so I think I have at least one bullet point in my list of, of topics that, that hits on what to do after an ICO. And we can definitely drill down with investor stuff at that point. Sure, that, sure. sense. that makes sense. So I was actually struck when I saw the title of this panel by the word secret. What is the secret to doing a successful ICO? And I just wanted to put that question to the panel just as a kicking off a topic of discussion. Is there a secret to doing a successful ICO? Oh, God. There are many secrets to doing a successful ICO. Can we take a question? Is this a success for the investor or success for the issue? That's the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so, okay, so there are a lot of, there are a lot of secret sauce aspects to it, right? Um, the first thing is, Really limit, for, for those that are looking at starting an ICO or launching an ICO, limit forward-looking statements, right? And, and make it very, very, very clear what your game plan is. Um, make it very clear if you're going after the utility aspect, if you're going after um, security, 
uh, 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 securities, if you're going after a currency or whatever else, right? Make it very clear, make that argument, and genuinely go for it. Um, the biggest, the biggest thing that I would say um, is have a product, have a product that ideally has sales, but at least an MVP that is ready to go when when you go out there. If if you don't, right? I, I'm, the, the the utility um, the utility token model or, or whatever there it, it kind of falls on its face pretty quickly um, there are some some vehicles like a saft if especially if you're proving um, you're proving a network launch you're proving utility right out of the gate something like that makes makes a big difference um, now for the investor perspective I think I think success post ICO is still um, still important um, for both aspects right. For an investor's angle, the biggest thing is do it just like, you know, invest just like you would a VC. Um, look at the operators, look at their market, look at their, their potential market opportunity, right? That understand the difference between a coin market cap and a market cap for the actual business. Um, it, it's not that complicated if you're a seasoned investor. The real problem is um, people that are uneducated, uh, investors, right, that, that really aren't sophisticated or don't understand markets, they don't understand macro effects or micro effects, uh, and they don't understand substantial valuation, they're just speculating on these things. That's where it turns into a really big danger in my eyes, um, because they just expect that everything's going to go up in value. It's, that's not the case, right? That's not how a real market works. So. Can, maybe I think we should take a couple steps back. Sure. <laughs> He, he has a tendency to get a little ahead of the game. Well, sorry. <laughs> is, I, I, but you, you raised, you raised a, a couple of things I think are important to make clear from the beginning is what kind of an ICO are you talking mm -hmm. about? Uh, is it going to involve a utility token? And I guess the question is, what is a utility token? How would sure, you define right. a utility token? Sure. Okay. So, so, and Carol and I have, have thought about this and trying to figure out exactly. We're, we're, we're both on the side of trying to actually actively steer and, and help uh, regulators understand what these things are, educate them, because most of them are, are pretty pro-cryptocurrency uh, and, and pro-blockchain. They just don't really understand. So. Um, you can really think of, of crypto uh, cryptocurrency as, as broken down by three or four different sections. Um, you really can think of things that are just currencies, right? They're just meant for um, buying and selling or storing value. Right? Uh, Bitcoin is a pretty good example of that, and so is Ethereum, because I think technically they're both out of the statute of limitations, right? Um, Bitcoin certainly is. But um, the other side of things is a security token, right? These are genuine securities. Um, Equities plays um, some derivatives in, in some essence, although I guess that essentially would be to other raise financial vehicles. to raise funds. Yeah, that's really what yeah, the purpose it, is. Exactly, it, it is a financial vehicle for for raising capital in any sort of uh, fashion. Right, this is where uh, the Howey test really comes in. If if you clearly fit within that Howey test, okay, great. Um, then you've got uh, transactional. They're also they've been referred to as utility tokens, although the regulators really are starting to hate that phrase. Um, Things along those lines, you can think of these as gift cards, or you can think of these as calling cards in some respects. Um, there are a lot of semantics, legal semantics around all this stuff, but I'm just trying to do broad strokes. Um, utility tokens basically came about because they fundamentally break uh, the, the fourth pillar of, uh, of, of the Howey test, I believe. Um, so again, we're jumping ahead of yeah, the story okay, all right. on the so, Howey test. <laughs> so that's, that's fine. So, so essentially, uh, a utility token is used for merely gaining access to a product, right? Um, in some essences, like an Amazon gift card that only allows you to buy specific products on Amazon. Um, that's a utility model, that's a transactional token. And, and, and then there's some al altruist ones as well that, that exist. So. so I think from the investor standpoint, understanding, well, both from the, from the entity that's putting a token out as well as from the investor standpoint is understanding the nature of the token to start with is, yeah. is what's critical. And the problem is, is that this whole area became so fast and furious uh, since just about this time last year. It's, April was really, I think, a defining line when the market for ICOs started to heat up. Uh, and it was, I think, the, well, Tyler, you were at the SEC. You had that history. You, you, oh, man, you know, yeah, they were yeah. talking about having to drink through multiple fire hoses at one time. Yeah, sure. It was just an extraordinary time. 
Uh, and I think what we've had to do is sort of pull back some, especially after the SEC chairman came out about four or five months ago and said there, there's not a ICO that he's seen yet that's not a security. And so we've been trying to work through and refine the dialogue in this area for a few months now. And one, one of the starting points is what kind of a utility are we, or I'm sorry, token are we really talking about? Yeah. And, yeah, and, and Jenna, from your perspective as someone who helps people write white papers, and how do you kind of work through or, or describing the, the functionality of the token, or what are some of the things you hear from uh, token issuers when they talk to you about utility versus security token, or how are they focusing on that, and, and was it how's it reflected in the white paper? Well, that is the million dollar question. Uh, I think that everybody wants to be a utility token, but I'm working more now. At I find with. STOs as opposed to ICOs because people are with STOs STO an STO is a security token offering so it's kind of it's been spoken about as being sort of the new ICO of 2018 that it, it's really to describe teams that have come to the realization that their token is a security and they're going to go the compliance route and pay the attorneys what they deserve to be paid to put something out that is not going to be shut down in three years. So that's really uh, where I find that my work is going. So I rely a lot. I, I, my, my place is sort of a funnel. So I don't know anything. I come into a project sort of dumb, and that's my job is to be the idiot in the room and say, okay, what is this thing? Because ultimately my job is to describe in a document what is going on to people who may not have ever touched cryptocurrency before, especially people who are investing in these from traditional industries or into, uh, like whether it be uh, accredited investors or the public, they sort of, the messaging in the paper has to be accessible to anyone. So my job is to come in and ask the questions that those people are going to ask and simplify things and layer the messaging to match what they're looking for. So I guess I can't really speak to what a security or utility is because I leave that to the attorneys who I work with really closely now. I find that I'm developing some really close relationships with those people because we're sort of, uh, we, because everything that I say they're also saying in the offering memorandum and it's like, you know, a very symbiotic relationship now. So I, I guess I'm just going to take the floor for a second and talk about like what I've seen in the industry as far as the white papers here. And when I came into this space relatively recently, May I interrupt for just yeah, a minute sure, and explain please. the white paper for those of you who don't understand some of the, but, I mean, people know what white papers are, I but, the, that, but okay, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was going to say that it's part, Sorry. Of, but it's part of the, uh, of what has become this, under this ICO umbrella is that every company, and I think largely because Satoshi Nakamoto, who was the person, attribute, the, the person attributed to having created Bitcoin, he put out a white paper. So every company that comes along now, whether they're doing a new currency or a utility token or just a security raise, they have to have a white paper. Yep. That's a really good point, and so I should probably back up because I'm so steeped in this that sometimes I forget, you know, not everyone is all reading the these things all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Satoshi's white paper fit the description typically of what people would call a white paper. It was technical, no marketing. It was, you had to read it three or four times if you weren't a, an engineer to understand what it was saying. And it's, a lot of the projects in the space have tried to imitate that white paper by only being technical. So what's happened is that crypto has grown to not just include crypto geeks who want to invest in the new sort of blockchain project, but now it's the general public and Wall Street and everybody else. So mm -hmm. these white papers have to accomplish a number of different goals from describing your technical platform, wh which what is it that you're building, and then they have to talk about why you should invest, and those are separate things. And so I come from 
creating proposals for that ultimately have to sell a product or a service. And because of that, I've sort of developed these skills to be able to assimilate the technical aspects and sell those as part of the, the uh, develop messaging out of those. And that's really what these white papers have to do now because even though you should have a product built when you launch, often they don't. So sometimes the white paper is all you have when you're going to investors and when you're saying we want money to do this and we want everyone to buy our token, that mm -hmm. white paper is your product. So when, the, when teams come to me, it's because they don't have any idea how to layer those messages on top of their technical platform because what I do is mostly platforms now. I don't work on as much of the, just the token with the smart contract anymore. Yeah. Like those things are kind of like uh, 2017. Um, <laughs> so uh, for the record, by the way, everybody yeah. in crypto refers to crypto as crypto dog years. Okay, um, mm. <laughs> life moves really fast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. really, really fast yeah. in, in crypto. Um, everybody that's used to financial markets or has been an investor, uh, keep in mind that uh, the crypto market never closes. It never stops. It's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and it will go up or down a thousand dollars in a few hours. Right? Um, a few minutes. A few, a few minutes sometimes. Like la last year, definitely. But from really last March, which is when I kind of got involved in, in, in starting and launching an ICO, um, to God, I guess really January felt like six or seven years for me. If, if you were around in the early days being last March, you know, uh, of, of ICOs, you were like, oh my God, where did you just come from? It was, it was, in, it was intense. Um, I, I got my first phone call in, in mid-2014 from someone, because the first ICOs, what, what really have given rise to this, happened in 2014. Yeah. Uh, the Ethereum, Ethereum was one of them, uh, Mastercoin was another, and I remember getting that phone call from, from someone who may be in this room, maybe not, uh, who said, uh, hey, so-and-so just did such-and-such -such last week, and they haven't gotten in trouble yet, so I can do it too. <laughs> and I'm like, no, because as far as I can see, and again, because of my, back, my background with the gold-backed digital currency, where we had looked very hard at whether we had a security or we had a currency, you know, these things called ICOs or these new tokens coming out looked really like they were securities in many ways. Uh, and I think I was right because the SEC today is taking action on some matters that happened as far back <coughs> as, as four years ago. And I think that's, that's a good, good kind of segue into one of the next <coughs> questions I think is important. Should the United States right now just be avoided altogether, or do we have enough information to make informed decisions about the ICO inside the United States? Uh, no to both. Um, I, I think we we need to meet in the middle. The regulators need to meet in the middle with the tech people. Um, but no, the, I, the the U.S. should not be avoided altogether. Um, I, I, one of the structures that we've recently stumbled upon, we've been trying to set up our foundation for a while. We have a, a Delaware C Corp, a Virginia LLC, a Wyoming uh, nonprofit. Like, you have to get really, really, really sophisticated and just kind of ridiculous with, with the formation structures. Uh, but one of the things that we discovered works really, really well is actually setting up a, a for-profit entity in some place like Gibraltar, Malta, um, Singapore, um, even Japan, Tokyo, you know, all, all these places, you set up a for-profit there whose sole shareholder is a U.S. nonprofit, right, or something along those lines. And it actually works quite, quite well, but um, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that the U.S. should be avoided. Um, there is so much powerhouse uh, here. Um, and when, when some of this regulation does come, uh, and, and again, I'm, I, I try to be on the front side of a lot of this. It's going to make a really good, positive, and, and big impact. Um, because once that, that ball gets rolling down the hill, I mean, it's going to be, I think, pretty massive. Um, the other side of it is, it really sucks sometimes to set up a foundation or, a, or a, another entity in another country. Um, there's a lot of complexity around it, and it, optically it really looks terrible for equity holders, uh, board people, or, or anybody else, right? 
So can I ask you a question? Absolutely. Who's issuing the tokens in that structure? Is it the C Corp or the foundation? No, the, the foundation. So, so effectively the way that it works is that the, the entity, uh, which is actually a, a for-profit foundation set mm -hmm. up in Singapore, has a Wyoming nonprofit as its sole uh, beneficiary or, or the sole um, uh, shareholder. Um, so essentially you try to align the incentives across the whole thing, um, but you don't have the regulatory constraints of being a nonprofit or, or a foundation or a nonprofit foundation in a place like Singapore. Now the reason that Singapore got chosen over, say, Gibraltar, which we had originally planned, Malta, Zook, Switzerland, um, Papua New Guinea, the Caymans, Puerto Rico, any of these places, um, is that they've got pretty well defined, uh, the MAS has been pretty well defined on what securities regulations are regarding mm -hmm. cryptocurrency, and for us it was just, I'd much rather know and pay a little bit extra um, than, than be uncertain all, all the time. Again, maybe a little bit more context on this whole conversation is that the first ones that were done, first ICOs in 2014, happened out of Switzerland. Yeah. They happened because you had a new platform, a new protocol that was being released in the form of Ethereum. They set up a not-for-profit because the intent was to use that not-for-profit in a way that we typically think about not-for-profits in the United States. Yes. The problem is, is once you have a successful fundraise like that, everybody else says, oh, we've got to do it that way. Yeah. Not yeah. really understanding why they're doing it that way. So everyone starts flocking to, to Switzerland. Switzerland realizes pretty quickly, oh my God, we've got a lot of stuff coming in here. And they realize that there's some of them that are really sort of not for profit in sort of the traditional sense, the, you know, whether it's do good. And, and then they also realize they needed a track for for-profit companies. So they have formed both tracks. Then we started seeing other countries jumping in and saying, wait, we're not gonna let Switzerland get all the money that's coming out of, you know, jumping on the bandwagon with these uh, ICOs. And we're gonna start to make ourselves friendly jurisdictions for that. So we saw Singapore, we've seen Gibraltar, Malta, and others. And Singapore and Gibraltar, I think, have probably made the greatest strides. From the perspective of whether you're an investor or you're a, uh, a company looking to do this, the first thing, the very, very first thing that you need to do is you need to sit down with tax counsel, knowledgeable tax counsel, to help you figure out what your goals are. Are you going to be a for-profit entity? Are you putting together something that should go into a not-for-profit entity? There's a lot of different pieces that have to go into that into that thought process. So I think that I, hopefully that helps people sort of sort through that this is not just boom, boom, boom. And I see it way too often. I'm like, slow down. We've got to get the we've got to get the tax piece worked out first. Then we have to start to layer on, you know, what the right jurisdiction is going to be. Yeah. So, for example, if you go to Switzerland, a lot of your documents are going to be in German. If you go to Singapore, they're going to be in English. In, in, if you go to Gibraltar and you can get listed on an exchange in Gibraltar, if you're doing an issuance, that may be a passport to have your token traded with people all over the world. But that right luck. now we've got certain issues uh, we're up against. But good luck getting in touch with lawyers there on a daily basis, by the way. In uh, Switzerland? Uh, no, oh, in Gibraltar. Gibraltar. This was the biggest nightmare. I mean, we paid almost a million dollars to, to lawyers there that never, ever answered the phone. I literally had to fly into Madrid and drive down once. Um, it's, it's, it's all difficult. Um, so, so what Carol's saying, right, that's really going from one to 100. That's how to, how to launch an ICO. Um, but the very first thing that I would suggest is that running a business is really tough um, in general, especially breaking down equities, uh, equity stakes for each of the partners, each of the, the employees, all of that stuff. I would highly, highly, highly recommend standing up some sort of business and doing an equity round first. It can be small, but you get a valuation, you understand what a 409A is, you understand the valuation metrics, you understand who's getting what stake, right? You have a due diligence packet, you have a lawyer, you have some tax counsel already set up. Understand how to create a real business, first and foremost, before you go launching uh, uh, anything else. It doesn't need to be a for-profit business, it doesn't need to be a non-profit business. Understand business, first and foremost, and then and then go from there, right? That you, You've got to do the zero to one. Um, 
And one of the things we found, if you ask what the stages of, whether it's an ICO or a STO or a TO, um, um, uh, it's sort of like Bitcoin and blockchain. At some point, people realized block Bitcoin was too tainted, so if the, the whole technology was going to move forward, we had to change the term to blockchain. So that's what we've been going through with ICO to, to STO. Um, but I, the sort of typical typical steps have been the pre pre sale, the pre sale, uh, now called private sale, and then the ICO, the 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 public offering, and that pre pre sale is where I think a lot of what you're talking about is very important that that very first stage because it costs money and it's costing more and more all the time to do an ICO. So what you do is you raise money in that pre-pre-sale reign of time, maybe a million, maybe two million, maybe up to five million dollars um, that's used to then fund you to get, you know, to hire Jenna, to hire the lawyers, to hire, you know, the, to the extent you've got an investment banking type firm uh, that's working with you, uh, and to pay the other expenses, the marketing expenses and so on around that. <laughs> Um, and then you can go to the pre-sale and, and, or the private sale. And these days, because of the issues in the United States, a good chunk of, uh, of the ICO <laughs> is happening in that time period, upwards of 80 plus uh, percent of, of it is being taken up in yeah. the, it would, because that's where you can carefully monitor and know that you're getting accredited investors who can come in and you can get an exemption from the SEC registration issues that you know keep you out of keep you out of hot water of the SEC generally right and so you know, speaking of terms that have been tainted like ICO Bitcoin blockchain and the like we, we know that a lot of initial um, coin offerings were kind of the first round of capital raising was done through these simple agreements for future tokens, mm -hmm. SAFs, SAFTs. Mm -hmm. and, and so now, after the, in, back in February, the SEC was reported to have delivered approximately <coughs> 60 to 80 subpoenas, right, mm -hmm. to, to various ICO issuers in the United States. And, and since then, I think the SAFT has, has kind of gone through a little bit of a, uh, a blemish on its record, mm -hmm. right? People are trying to avoid using SAFs now because they think it's tainted now that the SEC has somewhat spoken with delivering a bunch of subpoenas to a bunch of ICO issuers. Well, again, I think if we take a step back and yeah. say why were SAFs being used in the first place, you can understand why they have the taint and why they may not be as bad as they seem if you understand the right uh, 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 framework for it. So these were sim simple agreement for future future tokens, which uh, based on the safe agreements, simple agreement for future equity, and what they what they were used for was to sign people up to get them to commit to capital, based on a future issuance of a token, and they were being told by their lawyers that their token offering, their ICO, was not going to be subject to SEC regulation. <laughs> And suddenly, you were now creating a security within the context of that agreement. And that's where the SEC was really reacting. So, I think that's right. So, so if I can jump in, I have a little bit of, uh, I don't know. Experience? Uh, experience, yeah. So I, I was the first SAFT. Um, we did the first SAFT in the world. Um, I was with uh, working with Cooley on creating the SAFT at that stage, Marco Centuri, Patrick Merck. Um, Mike Lincoln, all, all those guys were, were working with us on, on doing exactly that. Um, the reason it's tainted isn't just just you know sort of what what was happening, but it comes down to a fundamental thing: is that nobody seems to bother to ask why something's done the way that it is, just how to do it. Um, the SAFT made perfect sense. It was a it was a Reg D filing, a Regulation D filing, and we did several other things, right? Um, it made perfect sense with one big element that people seem to forget, um, which is you had to have a network launch event. You had to actually have a product out and genuinely prove uh, um, that it was utility, that it had this before you issued anything else, before you sold anything else, right? You had to have a lockup period. You had to have all of these things that people just started sort of, ah, oh, we don't need that, we don't need that, we don't need that. <laughs> Those are kind of essential pieces to making this thing run. Um, and that's where you have a utility token. That's, that's that is exactly piece. where utility right. token came from, right? It was breaking, um, breaking this Howey test. So, so 
for those of you that don't know what, what the Howey test is, um, this is a Supreme Court, uh, uh, I guess, hearing or court decision. case Supreme yeah, just de decision um, that was defining what a security is, or it is or is not. Um, there are four a specific types. type of security. Yeah. yeah, that's what contract. Yes, yes. Sorry. So, so I'll I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to, to explain that the four. I think it was what the expectation. Of. Oh yeah. So, so if we all, uh, this is where the moderator becomes a member of the panel. So the, the if you go to all the the four major federal securities statutes, each one has a definitional provision. It's usually section two, and it defines a bunch of terms that are used all throughout the federal securities laws. One of the key terms, in fact, they're usually are in alphabetical order, but in the Securities Act of 1933, definition one, I believe, is the definition of security. And But each statute has a definition of security, and it's kind of like wine, right? There's many, wine is, is a class, and there's many things underneath wine that still constitute wine. You have Cabernet, you have Merlot, you have Bordeaux. So in a very similar way, you have a definition of security, and then you have a list of a bunch of instruments. A lot of these instruments that are listed in the definition would be instruments that any of us would reasonably conclude to say, yeah, that's a security, I recognize that. A share of stock, a corporate bond, we, an option, right? We all would recognize that as a security, but you would give your pause on one particular phrase. That one particular phrase is investment contract. What is that? That's very ambiguous. Anything can be a contract, right? You can write down on a piece of paper, I promised to buy this chair, at five bucks, and Carol and I can sign it, and we've entered a contract to buy a chair for five dollars. But what makes that contract not an investment contract? And and this is obviously a gross simplification. But the Supreme Court was challenged uh, by J. W. Howey, a guy, a farmer down in Florida, who had a bunch of orange groves, because he was selling investment contracts on rows of of oranges down in Florida to people up in the Northeast, saying you can have a piece of the Florida Sunshine Dream and we'll, we'll harvest all these oranges for you, we'll sell them, and then we'll send some of the profits back up to you. So this whole contract was challenged and went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know what, investment contract before we had the securities laws was a well understood terms in the states, because the states was where the first securities laws started. They actually started, I think, out in Kansas. They're called blue sky laws, because there's lots of blue sky out in Kansas. So we have state blue sky laws. And so the SEC said, back at the time when this or not the SEC, but the Supreme Court said back when we drafted this the statute, investment contract had a well-developed meaning in the states. And so they actually interpreted investment contract with that background in mind and came up with a four-factor test. And a four-factor test for when this particular type of instrument is a security, a, a, an investment contract, or a, a, any contract or any type of product is an investment contract and therefore a security you can apply this four-factor test to it. There's no need to apply it to a stock of Apple, a share of equity. There's no need to do that. It's already listed there. But when you, whenever you come up or come across a financial product and you're wondering, is, is this a security? Because it doesn't look like any of the other things listed there, you apply the Howey test. And so that's where we are in the token world, right? In the crypto world, we have this token, this new digital product what is it? It doesn't fit neatly within, typically, it doesn't fit neatly within any of the other listed instruments in the definition of security. Yep. So we apply the definite, we apply the investment contract test. And that is, is there an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectations of profit to be derived primarily from the efforts of a third party? And, and those are the four factors. Investment of money, common enterprise, expectation of profit from the efforts of a third party. Yep. So so where that utility aspect came in, and, and I'm I'm not a lawyer, right, so I, I can't give any legal advice as every lawyer has ever told me to say. Um, but but really where, where it came in for us with, with the SAFT was, was really that fourth one there, right? The expectation of, of an increase in value by, by the actions of a third party, the third party being the intermediate. Um, that was really what it came down to is saying, look, you must use this thing in order to get the product. Um, there is no expected increase in value because the product is live, there's a spot price for us. Um, again, another thing that people neglect to understand when they're doing this app, right? The, way, the reason it made sense for us was because for us it was $250 per month per user for a product or 100 tokens, right? It meant that there was an intrinsic valuation to the coin all the time. There was no expected increase in value. We never spoke about future uh, um, sort of 
expectations of, of growth or, or um, forward-looking um, aspects to what we were doing, it, there, there were a lot of there were a lot of you know large things about this. So the SAFT has gotten a really bad name, um, and I'm fine with that for everybody except us. Um, so I, I said that it's. it's shouldn't be looked at as being bad. Well, I think it's the actors that should be looked at as being bad. They're, they were bad actors. They just used something as, oh, this is a great get-out-of-jail-free card. It's like, no, it took a lot of effort to get there, and you really have to be very safe and secure about it. I think one of the things to keep in mind, I don't know how many of you, we didn't ask for the question, are looking at ICOs to just be a fundraise. And if you're talking about a fundraise, that's going to be very different from John's experience with the, the utility token. Uh, and from an investor standpoint, uh, you've got a different level of, con of, of concerns and issues. And as I said, I was at this Angel uh, Capital Summit last week, and um, one of the issues for angels is angels are used to making investments early in into companies and being able to take, get a seat on the board or get two seats on the board. Um, but with these, with these tokens, you don't have the ability, at least at this point in time, to negotiate for that kind of say with respect to the company. So it's often it's a fundraise, and it's a fundraise that's non-dilutive of, of, of equity. However, we're starting to see, and we're going to see a great deal of creativity, I believe, in the market over the next few months as people start to come out with different types of, of token offerings that represent different things. I'm involved with one company that is uh, the token is going to represent a stream of revenue, uh, a percent of the revenue that's generated off of the system. Uh, I'm involved in another project where it's going to represent uh, an invest, or it's going to represent a piece of a company that owns a very well known piece of property. Um, it's really, there's a great, I, I, I always tell people sit down with a blank piece of paper and create a new kind of, of instrument. But I think to Tyler's point earlier, is that um, the, we, have, we have a long history of regulation in the United States for what we do with people's money. So if it's not, if we have currency, which that's the province of the banks for the most part, banks, maybe money transmitters, non-banks that take customers' money and move it someplace else for them. Um, we have the securities firms, that we have rules around that. We have the insurance companies. And then we've got sort of this fail-safe, is that if it doesn't fit into any other category, the, the Supreme Court in particular, the courts, the regulators, are going to try their best to protect consumer money. And that's why this how we test and this whole analysis has become very important. I will tell you just anecdotally, as I sat with a couple of young men who are trying to put together their token economy, you know, the, in the context of the business model that they had, and I kept saying to them, you've got a security. You've got a security. And we kept going back and they're like, no, 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 no. And I finally realized that when I said security, they thought I meant equity. Mm, and right. I said, no, you know, it's, it's a catch-all for everything else that you can't put into these other uh, um, buckets. And with that, they go, oh, and our conversation changed dramatically. Right. Yeah. And, and Jenna, you, you, you talk to people about drafting their white papers. And are they coming to you saying, hey, Know, we're scared of the staff now. We want to go somewhere else. Is, is that something that you're hearing? No. Um, when people, I, I hear from a range of people, like uh, my inbox is just stacked. And what I find is that the people in this industry who have the background, that's what th happens is that I have this secret theory that's not secret because I'm going to tell you, but. Uh, <laughs> All of the social media experts from 2012 um, saw crypto and bought a few tokens and changed their LinkedIn profile to ICO and blockchain experts. Yeah. So <laughs> now we have all these ICO and blockchain experts out there yeah. that on LinkedIn and otherwise that it's really difficult to sift through all of that and find the people who can really help you to put in something together that's going to be really good. So uh, when I, so I get a request from all kinds of different people, and the first question that I ask now, and you guys will love this, is do you, uh, do you have an attorney? <laughs> um, and if they say no, it's click. Because, or I just tell them, like, listen, you know, I think that you have a really interesting idea, 
But if you don't have an attorney yet, you got a lot to learn no matter what your idea is. And so I had a guy uh, call me last year about a project that he really wants to work on and he just called me last week and he said, I got some funding for this, I got 250K, and I'm like, well, that's not enough. But <laughs> okay, that's great, congratulations. And he's like, well, uh, so I want to launch this ICO before the SEC starts putting in all these regulations because I want to get under the <laughs> under the door. And I'm like, okay, first of all, do you have an attorney yet? And he's like, no. I'm like, okay, dude. Like, <laughs> it's it's so there's all kinds of different like people who like st still hear about the ICO and and they want to launch their own token. And then I have projects and platforms coming to me that. Uh, what I find is now that there are existing companies that are already making revenue off of some other products that are launching a crypto to power another platform or start another sort of market with, with revenue streams coming into the token that then are dividend sharing with the investors. So that's a really interesting model that I'm beginning to see. And um, those projects I'm really excited to see launch. So, it's and and I find that the token structure can it it differs like for because I were I have so many different touch points now with different projects that are in so many different industries I see how they have to structure the token like sometimes it's a utility token inside of a platform that's a payment network and then outside of that there's a separate sort of situation where investors are, are investing in the token, but it's a separate, uh, like when inside the network, the token doesn't value doesn't fluctuate, so you're dealing in US dollars, and then outside of that, the investors are seeing that fluctuation in their investing, so, but there's different models. So I think that, um, I don't know about your question. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't like touch the legal stuff at all. I just talk to the attorney about okay, what what do I need to know for this specific project because it's so different for every every project and and the strategy for the attorney is going to be different. Like everybody sort of sees different like things coming down the pike. So and there are different competency levels with attorneys as well yeah. as you guys know. So. There's not all attorneys are created equal, though. Eh? You guys yeah. are going to be speaking, hearing from two pretty damn good ones. Mm -hmm. here. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it really does, like, the token structure can <laughs> really depend on the advice that the attorney is giving to how, what's going to be legal three years from now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, and there's and a lot of creativity going on in there. And that's a really. The, the advice issue is very important mm -hmm. because I've worked with, I'm not a securities lawyer. I have certainly learned a lot by osmosis um, and it was my favorite class in law school, but um, I, I have a tax lawyer on this side and I have a securities lawyer on this side. But what I have found is that really the best securities lawyers in this space are really IPO lawyers. Yes. Because they understand that whole process of bringing something to market. Uh, they understand early stage companies. They also understand a lot of the issues around, you know, how you can put something into the market when you deal with credit investors, when you can go public, yeah. you know, what it means to be listed on an exchange. And yeah. I think the exchange issue is a really important piece here because that's one of the areas that we're still waiting for a fairly big shoe, I think, to fall, and maybe yeah, a couple yeah. big shoes that's to right. fall from the SEC. Um, we still have a lot of SEC actions to happen that are going to fill in gaps, but for those of us who have enough experience in this area, we have a pretty good idea of what those, those, those gaps are that they're going to fill in and how they're going to do it. It's not going to be a surprise when it comes to us. But the exchange area, that's very important because a lot of the early ICO activity was fueled by the fact that you could get a token in an ICO and you could lie sometimes that you were in, not in the U.S. Um, uh, so sometimes it didn't even matter. Uh, and then you were flipping it immediately and flipping it on an exchange that was not a registered exchange, not an exchange that was registered to, to uh, deal with 
publicly traded securities, and the tokens themselves weren't appropriately registered. So you had two whammies going against you. Um, right now, most of the U.S. exchanges have shut down, though we have some of these decentralized uh, autonomous exchanges that exist that people still will may list their tokens on to trade. Um, but that quick flip of money, especially for U.S. residents, is sort of gone, though I know people have set up set up accounts or set up uh, uh, companies and offshore uh, uh, Velocity places. Gone yes. Either way, I mean, yeah. the, the velocity of the market's gone. Right? So, so it takes us back to, I think, a lot of what we're going to see over the next six months. We, we'll continue to see a certain amount of utility tokens, but I think it's going to be really much more of the raising funds, um, you know, just an outright security token. Uh, a lot of them are going to be accredited investors, most of them will be accredited investors, though I think by the end of the year we'll probably have a pretty good path forward on exchanges. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. It kind of is a nice dovetail into the what John, you brought up earlier. You want to talk about secondary trades and freely mm -hmm. trading tokens. Like, How do we get to freely trading tokens in the United States? If we're not going to avoid the United States, you know, if many of these tokens are going to at least start out their lives for some period of time yeah. as securities, you know, I think we're going to have to have some type of traditional capital infrastructure build up inside the United States, as Carol was alluding to, exchanges. Um, there are some ways for restricted securities to be freely tradable sure. after a holding period, for example, right? There are rules that say if you hold for 12 months, I like to say 366 days, because if you held for 12 months, it's hold for one more day, and it's just be sure, right? Um, so there are some holding period issues, but if we really want to ensure that uh, they stay freely tradable, for example, because if an affiliate of the issuer under the securities laws, an affiliate of the issuer touches the tokens again mm -hmm. after 366 days, now the clock's been reset. So yeah. we might have to start looking towards more kind of continuously always freely tradable tokens, which is going to be more regulated. So what do we what do we think is going to be coming down the pike? Carol, you're alluding to so so I, I, I've been working on on a, a regulation DA right digital asset right. I, I know it it works right. So we did Reg CF too right. Reg crypto. Uh, Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, so so, so uh, regulation D, regulation A, regulation um, uh, crowdfunding CF, and then now ideally we'll we'll get Reg D A uh, across, right? Which is just digital assets. Um, but essentially, what what the real problem is is that it's so undefined right now of what is and isn't legal for a liquidity perspective. Getting on an exchange. Um, it's really, really, really scary. It's the, it's the one thing from a founder's perspective that kept me up night after night after night. Um, because you've basically got 10,000 people that just put money in that are, you know, picketing and rioting on your Telegram or your, your, your social media or whatever else saying, where's the exchange, where's the exchange, where's the exchange, I want to get liquidity. I, I need to at least make sure that what I have can come back, even if it's at a little bit of loss. Um, that part's really scary, and it's amazing how much they, you know, there's sort of a peer pressure there. Um, the other side of it is everybody is telling you, don't go on an exchange, it's illegal. And then everybody else is saying, go on an exchange, we want our money back. Um, you know, and you've got the state level, you've got the federal level, and you've got the, the, the civil level, right? You, you, you could you could get a, a, a plaintiff uh, a plaintiff suit coming after you. Something that, that people don't really realize is that effectively, as soon as you actually launch and, and raise uh, and you close a, an ICO round, you're basically stuck between a rock and a hard place and, and figure it out. Um, what it ultimately came down to is just saying, "Fuck it, let's go." And 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 we did. And so far, okay. Um, I've just started sleeping a few few hours a night. Well, you have um, a baby in the house, don't you? <laughs> she's four. Um, yeah, she's she's four, and trust me, she sleeps way better than I do. Um, but yeah, it's just you, you, you don't really have a way of knowing. Um, now, I do think that we're going to have some some federal regulation this year. Um, we're certainly going to have state by state regulation. I've been working working on that. It's um, coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, for, for sure it's coming. Um, well, can, I, can I jump in and ask yeah. you a question about, like, we, we've seen some businesses try to um, go down the path of setting up exchanges like T0. Mm -hmm. um, there's several others out there, right, and, and trying to become national securities exchanges or alternative yep. trading systems. 
Um, guys, have you, what's, what's the word on the street from what you're hearing about the progress of that infrastructure being built out? Yeah, so I actually just spoke with Patrick um, yesterday from T0. Uh, yep. pa Patrick Byron um, is the CEO and founder of Overstock. Um, he's the one that started T0 as well. Um, then there's also Polymath, Trevor um, from Polymath yep. and several other places. Um, there's also lending platforms like Salt that I've been working with. Um, and and let me let me put one thing clear here. So um, we are one of the first utility tokens. We were the first SAF, but we're actually a hybrid model. Uh, lo Loki, my business is a hybrid model. Um, we are a utility token for essentially access to the system, and then it turns into an asset-backed currency from there that we've been working on registering as internationally for, for quite a while. Um, I personally think that's where things should be going longer term. Um, securities is a pretty good half step there. Um, well, I think that's an important distinction is, is it a security or is it a currency? Because right now we already have fairly well developed. We've got several years of history yeah. of exchanges that are dealing in currencies. Mm -hmm. Granted, some of that's been thrown into a little bit of question by some of the statements of the SEC chairman, but those entities um, are subject to regulation with the, with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network under the Bank Secrecy Act as money transmitters and are required to register as money service businesses and get AML compliance programs. They also have to be concerned about whether they're subject to state regulation as money transmitters. But I, and that's, I've worked in that area for a long time, number of clients in that area, and we've done a lot of work over the years. Then you've got this new, you know, the issue of what do you do once you move beyond currency and where's that line between currency and token, token as security. And that's where we've had a lot of build out. So with T0, they, they took several, a couple of years to get the right regulatory structure in place. Um, we've also had the alternative trading systems that have entered the picture. One of them is scheduled to go live in the next week, I think, yeah. which is uh, expected to absorb some of the, the need for, for exchanges, and there are several more that are stacked up. So we're getting closer and closer to having, having exchanges in the U.S. that are appropriately licensed. The real challenge is going to be is not so much the exchange, but are the securities, the, 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 the tokens themselves going to be in the right place mm. to trade on these exchanges? Because will they have been able to go through and get cleared by the SEC by that time? Um, so, so I just want to clear up a couple of things. So essentially, utility token, most beneficial by far for investors. Right for anybody buying in? No, no, no. I think I think those that are going in for fundraising can be really important. <laughs> well, Raising yeah. Funds. So, so, so I, I would say I would say that's really for uh, token holders, investors, whatever. U utility token makes a lot of sense. Um, security token much, much, much clearer and safer for the business. However, there's no liquidity yet. Um, there probably will be some some exchanges in liquidity, and and I think that regulation is a big a big part of all this. Um, but going back to your question here of sort of where where do we go and 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 what do we do with security tokens? What do we do with exchanges? Um, one of the things that I would love to propose for any business that's about to or that has already gone through an ICO or anything along those lines, or anybody that's looking to invest or buy into this market. Um, I'd like to see more companies do uh, a, a post-ICO equity round. Um, you essentially get a market or an auditor, a third party to set a clear valuation of what something is from an intrinsic perspective, defining the assets, due diligence packets, disclosures, all this stuff, right? You, 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 cement, you cement in this shape uh, of what the thing was and you can actually then fund from there or get some, some other capital. Um, when when I was launching um, our ICO, we did kind of a crazy thing. Uh, we asked for a fairly small amount of money, which was twenty million dollars, as opposed to the two or three hundred million that everybody was asking for. Um, that seemed crazy at the time. It's not so crazy now, right? It's nobody is making more than that, with the exception of a Telegram or WhatsApp or Facebook, right? Um, it's it, it's it's getting it, it's getting kind of refined now. Um, we're out of the woods. And, and I don't want to scare everybody off of this because it is scary and dangerous. But One of the things to keep in mind, which really hasn't, the next issue to come up or shortly that hasn't yet is what happens to these tokens in corporate transformations? Because they, 
<laughs> that, that's an issue that we haven't really started talking about, yeah. but these tokens are getting issued, and we're dealing with a lot of young, early stage companies that are going to go through multiple rounds of whatever, and what happens to the token holder in that process? Yeah. So okay. that, yes. that's my prediction for the future. Thank, thanks to each of you, John. I know you joined this panel last minute. We really appreciate you jumping on and, and taking, taking the bullet for your team here. Carol, I've seen you on several conferences, on several panels for the last two and a half years or so. It's, it's an awesome honor to be on a panel that I get to moderate with you on it. So thank you for coming. And Jenna, thank you for contributing. We really appreciate your perspective on white papers. Thanks. And for all of you guys, thank you for coming to the conference. We really appreciate your attention. And um, I guess I'll be hanging around for a little bit if you all have any questions and feel free to come up. So thank you. Thank you.